So, and, and believe me, I mean, there are many causes for us to be concerned and to, in a sense, worry. If you get a bad phone call and somebody that you love and you care about, they, they say, well, they're on their way to the ER. Well, that panic mechanism kicks in. You start freaking out, don't you? You start flying, throwing some clothes on. You're going to break every speed limit law you can think of getting to the hospital. Sometimes we just lose, lose sight of the fact that God is sovereign. These passages in, um, that we're going to talk about this week and next week, we're going to see that, yes, God is sovereign, but we're also going to remind ourselves that the God of the New Testament, the one that walked and talked with the disciples and touched and ministered to people face-to-face, hand-to-hand, Jesus, we're going to see that um, Jesus is um, completely sovereign. He's complete, absolute sovereignty. Supreme authority rests in the hands of Jesus. And I think that if we really got that, I think our lives would change a good bit. I think we'd have, uh, I think we'd sleep better. I think we'd probably make better decisions, right? Because when you're worrying and you get worked up about something, make an off-the-wall decision, and somebody's like, why'd you do that? Well, you know, I was just kind of scrambling around because all this is going on with whatever. And next thing you know, I mean, you're in the deep trouble because you lost sight, because I lost sight of the fact that Jesus is sovereign. When you look at the book of Matthew, first thing you'll notice, um, just, this is just kind of some catch-up work right here that we're going to do right at the front of this to get to Matthew 8 and 9. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So Jesus starts out with his ministry in Matthew chapter 4. He's, he's going to people. He's teaching in their synagogues. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So in summary, when we summarize Jesus' ministry, ministry in both word and deed, word is teaching and preaching indeed is healing. Jesus' ministry of the word and of deed, teaching and preaching and healing. When you get to Matthew chapter 5, verses, well actually chapter 5 through chapter 7, we have what's called the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, and what is Jesus doing? He's preaching. He's preaching, ministry and word. And then he goes into what we'll be dealing with, more or less, in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, is ministry and deed. And that's healing. He does work in people's lives, tangible work in people's lives. So Matthew chapter 8 and 9, we're going to look as best we can, as quick as we can, tonight, Matthew chapter um, 8. There's a little breakdown right there. This is kind of an outline. You can, you know, put that, cut that out and put that in the, as a bookmark right there. You can kind of have a general outline of Matthew 8 and 9. You see that there are three miracle stories. And then there's two descriptions of, descriptions of discipleship. Then there's three miracle stories. Then there's two descriptions of discipleship there in your notes. And then there's three miracle stories. So you see a little pattern there. Uh, one of the things that you notice if you study the book of Matthew is there's a lot of patterns. One of my favorite patterns in the book of Matthew is, is there's times where Jesus goes through a, a, a teaching section, and then there's a transition time where he says, and then he moved on, and he went somewhere else, and he did something else, and he did different things like that. One of the best transitions that actually isn't there is at the very end of Matthew, where Jesus has this teaching about the Great Commission, and then... <coughs> That's it. Because the transition of that teaching is us doing the great, fulfilling the Great Commission. And so you see some of these patterns when you study the book of Matthew. So let's look at um, basically the essence of the book of Matthew, the bottom line, the main point of the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 8 and 9, is Jesus possesses absolute authority in the world and warrants absolute allegiance from the world. 
So Jesus Christ is has absolute authority in the world, and he warrants absolute allegiance. If somebody is all powerful and all sovereign, that has to be true of them. So I think that's a good way to kind of sum up those two chapters in Matthew. So let's look at the supreme authority of Jesus in Matthew chapter 8. First thing we see is Jesus has authority over what? Disease. Anybody panic lately about disease or anything? It's funny, like when he, whenever you go to the doctor, they, one of the questions they ask you now is, have you recently traveled uh, anywhere in, in a foreign country lately? And it's funny, I'm, I'm at the doctor, I'm always like, um, I, how, how far out are you are asking? <laughs> Next time throw them a curveball and say, yeah, I've been to West Africa for the past nine months. And, just kidding, just kidding. Oh, don't, don't panic. Um, but, you know, we see that Jesus has authority over disease. Let's look at this passage right here. He cleanses the physically unclean. Jesus has authority over disease. He cleanses the physically unclean. I love this passage in, in, in Matthew here. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, make me clean. That knelt before him, that proskuneo, that prost, that's, a, that's a symbol of, of worship. He came and he prostrated himself before Jesus. He knelt before him and said, Lord, what did he say? If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And then what happened? And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. All right, here's some homework for you. Out beside that, write Leviticus 13 and 14, and you'll find out what he's talking about here from the law. You'll also be like, are you serious? When you read that, you're like, that's crazy. One of the things that you'll notice in the Gospels, when Jesus is dealing with the law, you'll never hear him say any kind of derogatory remark about it. You never hear him say anything ill about the law. His tone is always, like he, he has this respectful tone about the law, but he also knows the truth, the theological truth, that he came to fulfill the law. And so anytime you see Jesus doing certain things like that, when he's referring back to certain things that need to happen according to the law, Sometimes you find things like this where Jesus didn't have to. He could have just been like, "Hi, bye, buddy, you're good now. But no, but he wanted to be, in a sense, respectful. Um, there's a lot of commentators that debate on the reasons for that. Um, another thing that, that I want to pull out of this passage is this um, stretching out his hand and touching him. Nobody touched a leper. Nobody. Now, this term, stretching out his hand, it's not like the, the Grinch song, like the 84-foot pole that you wouldn't touch the Grinch. It's not like he stretched out his hand and, and touched the leper. Like, he had this embrace feeling with it. So it's like he came to his leper and put his arms around him, touched him on his skin, skin, skin. You didn't do that with a leper. But Jesus did. I mean, that's our saving. I mean, when you think about how deep and dark and nasty you were in your sin, because that's, that's the truth, Jesus came to you, reached out his hand, embraced you, he cleansed you, he healed you of your sin problem, and now, yeah, sure, why not? Gives you a high five, right? Because he's, he's a good friend. Jesus, uh, I mean, what the leper does know is Jesus is able to heal. What the leper doesn't know is Jesus is willing to heal. Why is it that so many times in the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and this is the only place you find it, that people think that Jesus can actually heal them? Why do people know that? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we're eight chapters into the book of Matthew. Nobody else is going around healing lepers. Why do people think that Jesus can do that? 
That's what he was doing all the time. I mean, we just read back in chapter 4 that he would go and he would heal every kind of disease that he came around. So he got this reputation of healing diseases, and that's good. That's why people would come to him. He's willing. He's able and he's willing to heal. Jesus identifies with the uncleanness of the leper in order to make the leper clean. That's that whole understanding, that whole idea of him embracing the leper. Jesus would be the one to embrace the leper. When anybody else would be like, you've got to go over there. You've got to stand over there. You've got to do your thing over there. Maybe it'll work out for you. Reading in Leviticus. There's, it's really fascinating in Levit Leviticus 13 and 14. You should read it. I mean, it's crazy stuff. It's pretty fun. I mean, you probably will laugh out loud. I do. So not only does Jesus, not only does he cleanse the physically unclean, but he heals the ethnically outcast. Next thing, B. He heals the ethnically outcast. Let's look in ver uh, verse 5 through 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, Appealing to him. Is this person coming to him? Is this a Jewish person? No. This is, it, this is like one of those cases where there's so many uh, distinct uh, cultures in a, in a place where they would kind of like, okay, you're over there, you're over there. You know, you've seen the movies and you've seen the, the, the TV shows about the high school, like the jocks are over there and the band people are over here. And the theater people over there. Like this, that's that's how it was in Jesus' time. Like the Jews, you guys go over there. And the, the Romans, y'all are over here. And the lepers, you guys go past way out there. And so there's very distinct lines here. But now Jesus is he's, he's crossing this, this this ethnic boundary here. And he's going to the uh to centurion. He came forward to him, appealed to him, Lord, my servants, lay paralyzed at, at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. I'm sure there was somebody that heard Jesus say that, and they were like, no, you, you, you're not the one over there, are you? He said, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So he's kind of a powerful man who's bowing before Jesus. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, no one else in Israel with faith have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom, it's a different kingdom he's talking about here, will be thrown into outer darkness in a place that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. We see faith, a good representation of faith right here. I mean, people, I mean, you got to realize the same, the same story happens in the same Bible where people are like ripping someone's roof off just to get someone to lower somebody down into, to, into the proximity of Jesus. And this guy's like, You just say the word. I'm like three blocks down the road. You got your thing going on here. You just say the word and he's good. I don't have to drag. I don't have to like lift him up. I don't have to. And so Jesus commends his faith. Faith is humble trust in the authority of Jesus. Faith is humble trust in the authority of Jesus. Such faith is the essential determinant of a person's eternal destiny. What do I mean by that? Well, when you consider John 14, 6, what did Jesus say? He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except for me. Jesus brings this uh, eschatological, this end kind of end times, end of life situation to this teaching when he starts talking about the, the outer darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because he knows, I mean, he's like, he sees this faith in front of him, and it makes him think of eternity. And so he, he, he delivers this great teaching to us about faith. As he's healing this centurion servant, who's, I don't know, it could be next county over. 
let's, let's keep going. He restores the culturally marginalized. Culturally marginalized. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. So here's some clues there you might not know. Peter was married. His uh, mother-in-law lived with him. I'm sure that uh, provided a lot of uh, interesting things going on in the house. He touched her hand. The fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. He was busy. He was working hard. Tending to the needs of the people. Ministry in word, and now we see ministry in deed. Jesus, whatever the, whatever the problem was, he would touch them. He would heal them. He would straighten backs out. He would open eyes. So I had a fever. He touched her. Now, there's so many things like culturally going on when you read the New Testament that if you had any kind of like Jewish background or if you knew some manners and customs of Jewish uh, history with people, like there are so many things that you would just start, you would shake your head. Left after right, things that Jesus did, you'd be like, I can't do that. I mean, this lady's sick. This is a lady. And Jesus went to her and touched her. Normally people don't touch sick people. And guys don't touch women. Not in this culture. So that's why we say that he restores culturally, the culturally marginalized. He comes to essentially nobodies who can't help themselves and he touches their life, and he makes them well. I mean, these are just pictures of me and you. He comes to you, me. I'm a nobody. He touches my life. He makes me well. Then the question comes, are we going to be like this lady? Are we going to be like, man, I feel great. I'm going to go back to my thing. Or are we going to do what she did? What did she do? She rose and served him. She got up and she served Jesus. If Jesus has come to you, and if he's touched your life, he's made you well, that's the only logical response. To say, well, I guess I'm just going to serve Jesus recklessly for the rest of my life now. I think that's a good response. And we see that in verse 17, this is still what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. You can look up Isaiah 53. Make a note out there. Read Isaiah 53. You should, most of you know a lot of that by heart just because it's such a, just a deep messianic prophecy about Jesus. He has the power to overcome all our suffering because he paid the price to overcome all of our sin. So we see in these stories, of these healing stories, we see that that Jesus flexes, in a sense, his authority to heal these, these diseases. He, he's boss over these diseases. And he comes to them and he, he heals these people. So he has the power to overcome all of our suffering. Let's keep going. Let's look at number two. Jesus has authority over disciples. But what you find here, I put 18 there, it's actually... Um, Eight, my bad. Matthew, you can scratch out that one. Matthew 8, 18 through 22. That's where I came from, I guess. What we find here is this tone change. A little bit. So Jesus, in this chapter, I love this chapter because he's doing some incredible things, but he's also saying some incredible things. And then he's saying some things that, like, oh, ugh, you went there? Like, ouch. So his tone kind of shifts a little bit. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came with him and said, teacher, rabbi, rabbi. He said, he acknowledges that Jesus is a little more lofty than he is. This is a scribe. A scribe comes up to him and says, rabbi, okay? So a scribe normally is somebody that's, that's above us in here, okay? But the scribe acknowledges. So it's pretty good right here. He's, got, he's on a good, good track so far. He says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That's what I'm talking about. And Jesus, what is this? What did Jesus do here? Like, it's almost like this is like an evangelism class. Jesus just failed a project. Okay? Like in seminary, in evangelism class, 
This wouldn't be done. Like if somebody came up to me and said, hey, you're a pastor over there at church on the road. Tell me what to do. I'll follow Jesus, no matter the cost. I would be like, all right, let's talk. Let's sort this out. But what does Jesus do? He says, you know what? Foxes have holes. Birds in the air, they have nests. But the Son of Man, talking about himself, he basically said, I don't even have a home. I don't have a place to lay my head. That's all he says to him. The scribe comes up to him and says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. I don't really even have a home to go to. And then somebody else comes up to him. I'm sure the scribe's like, did that just happen? Like, I practiced this. Like, I knew Jesus was in my town today. Like, I'm standing in front of the mirror. All right, what am I going to say to him? This is my shot. And then Jesus just, bah, just blows and just shuts him down quick. Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. I mean, that's admirable, right? You would think that that's, that's, a, that's a pretty noble thing to do, right? Is his, is his father dead? He's really, really sick? Maybe he's about to die? He loves his father. He cares for his father, obviously. It's very important to him to take care of his dad. I mean, how many times have you heard a story of a son or a daughter that is just has an elderly parent and they're sick and they take, can't take care of themselves and this person, this son or this daughter could care less about them and that drives you crazy, right? There's something in you that you want to like say something to them like, why don't you take better care of your parents? Why don't you take better care of your dad, your, your grandmother? Like, you know, that kind of wells up in us. Man, why, does that, why, why do we care about that? Because like, there's, there's a little justice thing that we have when somebody is being treated ill. Like, especially as a believer, you want to be like, no, you can't do that. This guy comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, I'll follow you. But, you know, my dad, I need to take care of him because he's in a bad spot. I'm going to bury him. Now, maybe Jesus knew a little more than we did. Maybe this, this dad's okay. He's just waiting for his son to come home so they can shoot another round of pool or something. And, but, but regardless, Jesus said, follow me and lead the dead to bury their own dead. Did this guy walk away disappointed? I would think so. What about this scribe, too? He walked away disappointed? I don't think so. So we see that Jesus has authority of disciples. Hey, Jesus is worthy of unconditional trust. And he's worthy of undivided affection. Jesus understands that there's nobody above him. There's none greater than himself. And he understands that he's worthy of unconditional trust, undivided affection. I mean, there's, there's several stories in the, in the Gospels where dealing with family, that Jesus says some hard things. When, when they come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, your brother, your mother, your brother, they're outside waiting on you. And Jesus just completely disacknowledges them. He says, that's not my family. My family are the ones who do the will of God. And maybe that's part of the reason that some of you feel that way about your church. You know what I mean? You go to a family reunion or a Christmas gathering or Thanksgiving when your family gets together and you're like, I mean, you like your, your family and their family. But why do you have a closer, deeper connection with your Sunday school class? I think many of you are tracking what I'm saying there. Let's keep going. Anybody know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? If you've never read his biography or you don't know his story, it is incredible. Incredible. There's a book by Eric Metaxas that came out. It's like that thick. It's like a boat anchor. Some of you guys can't zip through a boat anchor like that. It's a very detailed biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He also wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. It talks about costly grace. Very costly. The one is Dietrich Bonhoeffer gave his life. He's a martyr. He's also a spy. He's also a German uh, theologian. Came to the States 
and he was very sought after and all people would come to him and listen to his lectures and he was you know, teaching at a prominent university but then he went back to Berlin he went back to Nazi Germany because he thought he had some 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 stuff that he could still do there and they they killed him he didn't want to save all those Jews he he if you get a chance, what you can, you don't have to read the big, thick book, just Wikipedia, this guy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's a pretty incredible story. He said this in the cause of discipleship. The messengers of Jesus will be hated to the end of time. They will be blamed for all the divisions which rend cities and homes. Jesus and his disciples will be con condemned on all sides for undermining family life and for leading the nation astray. They will be called crazy fanatics and disturbers of the peace. The disciples will be sorely tempted to desert, to desert the Lord, but the end is also near, and they must hold on and preserve it until it comes. Only he will be blessed who remains loyal to Jesus and his word until the end. Does that sound like a German Christian in Nazi Germany? Sure does. Does that sound like a Christian American in 2015? Not at all. Because our culture has produced a Christianity that is, I don't know, good, I don't even know, really a good word sometimes. Sissified, maybe? Watered down. Watered down? Sissified. Sissified, do you like that one? Todd likes sissified. But there's a difference between a nominal churchgoer and a disciple of Jesus. And that's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is realizing here. That's what he realizes in the call of discipleship. It's a good read. You check it out. Jesus has, let's keep going. Jesus has authority over disaster. Over disaster. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. How are we doing on time? All right, we're okay. I'm going to keep rolling. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. Now, they weren't in a big boat. So evidently, Jesus is pretty heavy asleep. And they, they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And as he wiped the sleep out of his eyes and stretched a little bit, he said to them, Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? So the weather is being mean to the disciples, and now Jesus kind of did you know, taking a stab and being, being realistic, but, you know, he's saying, why have you little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the seas, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey? Now, I've been, at, at, you know, we've seen some pretty nasty weather. Some, my dog just goes crazy in this bad weather. Some of you maybe panic a little bit in bad weather. But what if you knew somebody and knew when a storm, big thunderstorm came on and they just spoke to it and the storm was instantly like, you got it, we're out of here. If somebody could do that, in your, if you knew somebody that could do that, you know, sometimes we kind of look down at the disciples for like, oh, why did they, why did they react like that? They should have been like, yeah, we're on King Jesus. Get out of here, wind and waves. But it's like their, their fear is shifted away from the storm to him. And I think that's, I mean, that's verifiable, I think. I think I'd probably do the same thing. But Jesus has authority over disaster. The wind and the waves, they know his voice. And they obey his voice. Now the point of this story is Jesus is God. The point of this narrative here, Jesus is God. The promise in the story is that I'm never alone. Now, I wasn't put, you are never alone, but while I was doing this, so, you know, I want to put, I am never alone. So when you write, I'm never alone, you need to realize that. That no matter how bad the wind and the waves can be, you are not alone. Whatever storm you're in, tossed about, in the seas right now in your life. You just barely made it to church tonight. You're barely hanging on in a couple of areas in your life. Tossed about a little bit, aren't you? 
You're not alone. Not all the storms in your life will end soon. I don't know if that's any comfort. However, all the storms in your life, they do have a master. The same wind and waves that listened to Jesus' voice way back then, they still know his voice. Now, Jesus had an opportunity to teach about faith in that boat, in that storm. He had an opportunity to disciple his disciples in that while the, the, the boat was rocking back and forth, who knows how long they were there. Jesus has an opportunity to disciple you as you're being swayed, rocked back and forth, to and fro, in whatever the storm you find yourself in. And maybe it's a storm you brought about on your, on your own. You did that to yourself. One of the things that I realized um, pretty soon after becoming a believer and really growing in my faith as a college student and you know, just seeing how the world works is the Lord cares more about the quality of my character than the quality of my circumstances. And so sometimes a boat in a storm strengthens and shapes the quality of our character. And he does that through ill circumstances sometimes. Been there? Done that? Some of you got some of you are tracking back in your in your timeline behind you of storms and trials that you've gone through. Well you cried out to the Lord. You shook him, Lord, wake up and say something. Get me out of this. But through it all, he was there nonetheless, by your side. And if you came out with stronger faith and missing both of your legs, you came out better. Does that make sense? Whatever it was. Jesus has authority over demons. When he came to the other side, to the country of the get um, Gettering, get Gatherings, two demon possessed men met him. Coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. I mean, these guys are like, man, monsters. Little kids are scared of these. I mean, nobody goes this way because they're afraid of these crazy demon possessed men that live in the cemetery. I mean, that's pretty freaky. I mean, that's horror story stuff. I mean, that's movies that we. Hollywood would have fun with that. Two guys live in a cemetery that are wreaking havoc on kids and ladies and neighbors. And behold, they cried out, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us? Before the time? So, I mean, they're like, What are you here? You know, that's, that's pretty good. I heard a pig was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, You cast us out, send us away to those herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out of the pigs, and they came into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned in the waters. A whole year and a half, two years' salary for the herdsmen. They probably didn't like that too much, did they? They rushed down the sea bank and the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled. Who were they afraid of? And going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. What happened to these demon-possessed men? At this point, they're probably like, all right, well, that's good. Let's go get a job or something now. <laughs> Let's follow Jesus. Jesus might say to them, I don't even have a bed right now. Behold, the city came out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him to leave. So at some point there was a shift. Because when Jesus did things that shook things up a little too much, this happens often in, in the Gospels. Jesus would do or say something that caused people to ah. There's a lot of mm, a lot of grumbling that happens. People hear Jesus 
say something they don't like. I mean, eventually what happened to Jesus? He was crucified. He was an innocent man. He was brutally slain. It's a public shame, reproach for all to see. Whipped, beaten, naked, blood. He has supreme authority. And even under that supreme authority, he went to the cross for me and you. Couldn't there be a different way? Somebody who has absolute authority, couldn't he got himself out of that situation or something? That was the only way. And here you are in 2015, Mississippi. And we have the same Savior that walked with these people, that said these things, that did these things. The same Savior that looked at the storm and said, that'll do, you can go now. The same Savior that looked, looked at these demon-possessed men and these demons are trembling in fear over him. That's the same Savior you have today. The demons have fear because of their belief. Why are they afraid? Because of what they believe about Jesus. That's why they're afraid. That's why at this point they are worried. That's why they are trembling when they come before Jesus, because they are concerned for their well-being. We have fear and worry because of our unbelief. One of the greatest things that anybody ever said to Jesus, man says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's good. I think that would be a good prayer for you to adopt occasionally. Okay? Just say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because that's what worry is. Worry, in a sense, is unbelief. When you are worried, worrying yourself sick about something, you stop believing that Jesus has authority. You've, you've forgotten that Jesus looked at a storm and said, all right, go somewhere else. Forgot, we forget. Unbelief is what it is. So this just bends us towards the reality. We just need to, to trust Jesus more. We need to remind ourselves who has supreme authority. And here's what's great about Jesus and his supreme authority. Jesus and his supreme authority is, is huge and magnificent as it is. As it is. It's not something that's far away and far off and unreachable. Because the Spirit of Jesus lives inside of us. There's a book that recently came out that said, uh, the Spirit within is better than, this, than Jesus. Or Jesus beside, I mean, I, I messed up the title here, but in, in a sense, it's what's better? Like the Spirit within you or Jesus beside you? So we have the Spirit living within us. We have the Spirit of God within us. So why do we worry? Because Jesus has supreme authority. We can trust Him wholeheartedly. I think all of them will come up. Yeah. Because Jesus has supreme authority. We can trust Him wholeheartedly. We can rest peacefully in Him. Amen? So instead of us freaking out in the storm and Jesus is asleep, just lay your head on a soft pillow. You go to sleep in the storm. We can submit completely to Him and we can rejoice gladly in Him. Why? Because he has complete authority. Amen. Let me pray, and uh, we'll get out of here. You ready? Let's pray. Lord, help our unbelief. God, forgive us of our worry.
Remind us that you are completely and totally sovereign, that you have supreme authority. Thank you for being patient with us, Lord. God, we love you. We pray this in your good name. Amen. Right. Have a good rest of the week. Love y'all. <coughs>